Pucks with Hags is brought to you by Price Picks and the Game Time app. Welcome to another edition of the Pucks with Hags podcast, powered by Price Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. I believe it's the 137th episode of the Pucks with Hags podcast. I have with me today the Boston Herald, Steve Conroy, longtime friend and colleague Mick Collagio. Thanks for joining me, boys. I'm Joe Haggerty. Uh, the host of the Pucks with Haggis podcast. You can find my work at joehaggerty.substack.com. Subscribe and get a premium membership. You get all of my writing sent straight directly to your inbox. I also write columns three times a week for the Boston Sports Journal after Bruins games. Uh, before we get into it, and we're going to get into the awful 8-2 to two loss to the Carolina Hurricanes last night. Really just a bad month for the Bruins uh, so far. We're going to talk about that, talk about the struggles, talk about Jim Montgomery, all that stuff. Uh, I first want to thank our sponsors real quick. Uh, prize picks download the prize picks app today and use the code clns and get 50 dollars instantly when you play five bucks that's code clns on prize picks to get 50 dollars instantly when you play five dollars you don't even need to win to receive the 50 dollars bonus it's guaranteed prize picks run your game uh, let's also thank the folks at game time download the game time app create an account and use the code clns for 20 dollars off your first purchase terms do apply but again download the game time app create an account and use the code clns for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. What time is it, Mick? Game time. Game time. All right. Um, dreadful, embarrassing, really bad. Like, worst of the season, clearly, and worst of the last few years. 8-2 to two loss to the Carolina Hurricanes uh, last night. Uh, a lot of different things going wrong. Uh, a lot of different uh, elements of things that have gone bad for the Bruins that we've seen in this four Six and one uh, start to the season, or is it four seven and one now? I can't remember. Where four are we six at? and one. Four six four, and six. one. Thank you. Yep. Um, last place in the Atlantic Division, I, third worst goal differential in the Eastern Conference, uh, ahead of only the Pittsburgh Penguins and the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, Steve, your thoughts just on last night as a game uh, and what we continue to see out of this team here in the first month, or what was the first month? Yeah, I mean it's a, more of the same times 10 last night, uh, yeah. you know, can't make simple passes. You know, they're, they're giving the opposition and, and Carolina was able to take advantage of it more than any other team, giving the opposition, you know, all the skating room in the world to, to, to gain the zone and come at them at, with speed. Um, you know, they, they got what, four even strength shots through, through two periods. Yeah. It, it was just ridiculous. And they're, it, I, I can't remember a time where they've had team-wide yips with the puck. You know, they just can't handle the puck. Um, you know, they're getting, getting stripped behind the net. Um, the first goal, what were they at? on the delayed call? They had four guys behind, below the goal line on it. Yeah. it like, everybody's yep. trying to do everybody else's job now. Um, you know, I don't know how much the, the wholesale line changes – had to do with it. I was definitely in favor of splitting up uh, Elias Lindholm and David Pasternak. That just wasn't working. But the, uh, you know, blowing up the fourth line and sprinkling them throughout the lineup was some pretty out of the box thinking, I thought. Um, but they they look like a team that, you know, had never played together last night. Yeah. Uh, zero chemistry, like simple mistakes. Uh, there was another uh, goal where uh, I think it was Brazo and Max Jones, the Orlov goal, were like loafing it back up the ice on the back check. Didn't even come into the picture until the very end when Orlov gets the puck and scores and just very slow coming back uh, to help out the rest of their teammates. Uh, the one on below the goal line where Ros- Roslovich was wide open in the slot and he scored again later in the game, wide open in the slot again, just not covering the middle of the ice at all defensive yeah. zone coverage wise, bad penalties, as you said, just no offense five on five. Um, and the passing was very obvious last night, watching some of the decisions they were making and some of the passes they were throwing to each other. They simply couldn't get the puck up the ice, complete one or two passes no. in a row uh, and get it up against Carolina. And, you know, and they can't, I they really can't get the really, puck deep. They, no, know, with the, they, they can't even dump the puck in right now. Which is what they should be doing, right? If they yeah. can't complete passes and if they're having problem making, you know, the the fancy plays or the complicated plays, they should just be getting in deep and playing simple hockey. And they're not doing that either. Um, 
Mick, and frankly, the, the the mixing of the lines last night, doing what he did with the fourth line, I think this is desperation from Jim Montgomery. I think this is Jim Montgomery trying everything he possibly can do or can think to do to try to get some kind of a different result or some kind of spark with this team. And, and uh, the spark plugs aren't working. You know, the jumper cables are not working with this team right now. Everything they're doing right now is not working and not getting any kind of a result or a jolt out of this team. Yeah, Mick, where are you at right now after this loss, what you've seen this entire month with this team? Well, I just saw Steve take a sip of his coffee from that (laughs) very tall, skinny uh, travel mug, and I have the same exact one, so we have team chemistry. There you Um, go. That's good. I'd see last night one pass, two pass, and then the third one would be somehow rushed, screwed up, the puck bounced, it went off the stick the wrong way, and – Next thing you know, three guys are going this way and the opponents are coming that way and they are now the puck and the scouting, the pro scouting is now changed. Here's the Bruins. Get them to panic, rush them because they're fragile. They can't complete three passes now. Go after them. So it's almost a good thing for when the time comes that this team finally gets out of this because we know that bad hockey from a good hockey team eventually becomes uh, they go on a streak. And that's because the pro scouting, I think what happens is, is rather than being fundamental based on the Bruins are playing well, it's now based on how poorly the Bruins are playing. And so by rushing the Bruins, they're getting more spectacular results because it's really Lucy in the chocolate factory right now. But if, if the Bruins get it figured out, then, then the pro scouting will stop working in, in a spectacular way. Uh, they're rushing the way they're trying to rush the Bruins right now. The Bruins, they'll start looking like the Bruins playing them. Uh, But we're nowhere near that yet. Right now we're at that desperate point where the locker room talk has now shifted to we need to stick together. Obviously the speeches were made before the media access after last night's game that we need to stick together. And that was echoed by Montgomery, by Trent Frederick, I'm sure by others. And that this is, this is where this is going now. This is now they're circling the wagons. It's us against the world. And this is now going to be their strategy going forward. Uh, Who knows what executives thinking. And I know you're going to bring that up in a bit. Uh, But yeah, Yeah. that's, that's how I felt about it. And and because I, I think part of the the thing that I saw when they uh, isolated in, in, on watching on Nesson, the four Bruins below the goal line all at once, their own end, they all sunk down there. I think Carlo was last to go. And for th- when you have that many down there, then you have a lack of awareness of where your teammates are, a lack of belief where they are, which is a lack of trust yeah. where they are. So that's the huge problem right now. They're all trying to do too much, and it's all becoming exaggerated. It's a big pie in their face. Yeah. Uh, and here's one issue I have uh, and one problem I have with what's going on. And I, I'm of the belief – um, and we'll get into this later, but I'm of the belief that something needs to change in order to snap them out of this. I, I think they're in a spiral right now where I don't think they're going to be able to just circle the wagon, say we're, you know, we're all in this together and we're not going to point fingers and, and pull themselves out of it. Um, I, I think something's going to have to cha- change and something's going to have to happen with this team. But like one concern I've had, and, and you know, this might be part of the problem is I've now heard this a couple of times, Jim Montgomery last night. Uh, We had a lot of success the last two years, and we were first place at Thanksgiving the last two years, and we never achieved anything we wanted to. Right now, we're not happy. Nobody is happy with what's going on, but we will get better. We will get out of it, and hopefully it creates a better result come playoff time. Playoffs. They're in last place right now. Uh, I heard Jim Moore in my head. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it starts by sticking together and by working. There really is no substitute for second and third effort. Now, I agree with the second half of his sentiment, but this is similar to what something that Charlie McAvoy said, right. That's what McAvoy um, said. like a week or two ago, yeah. where he was basically talking about how, you know, they've always come roaring out of the gate and maybe this is the way they should do it and not being stressed about it and like all this other stuff. This mentality right now that they're thinking they're going to flip some kind of switch and be okay and, like, it's going to create a different result come playoff time by them basically not showing up for the entire month of October, that's a horrible mentality. It's a bad I, – I don't even like that they're going there saying this kind of stuff because I think they're excusing how bad they've been and thinking that they're going to be able to flip a switch and turn it on. Now, I do agree 
like everybody's jumping all over the Bruins saying they're, you know, big and slow. They got too many big physical players in the summer. They're not slow enough to compete. They're a terrible team. Like they're way better than what they've shown. There is no doubt in my mind. They are far better than what they've shown. They have much more potential. They're a better hockey team in this way better. And I don't think that all of a sudden they've become big and slow and they can't compete in the NHL. But I think a lot of what's going on is is mental and and emotional and effort wise and a lot of these different areas uh, that shouldn't be problems with this team. And I do not like Mick what I'm hearing from Jim Montgomery saying that last night and from Charlie McAvoy saying that earlier, basically saying, ah, oh, you know, we were leading uh, the the division in in Thanksgiving the last two years, so we're going to try it a different way and just absolutely suck until Thanksgiving this time around and like turn on a switch. I, I just don't like hearing that from them. I think that's a bad way to think about it. Well, the 71 Canadians, the 2009 Penguins, the 2016 Penguins, the 2019 Blues. If the team start thinking, if the Bruins start thinking this is a strategy, then that's a very bad, at least optics level. It's I get what they're saying, and I think there's merit to it for us to be. If it's us saying this stuff, there's merit there because we've seen it with other teams. But they all included one thing in common. They had a coaching change in season. And yep. that was what fired it up. In the case of the 75-76 Bruins, it was the biggest trade in franchise history. You know, so yep. you st- I, I don't think I've seen so many – uh, regulars from the prior season start off so far off their game as I did yeah. back in 75, 76 or hasn't come back from his knee. So he hasn't played his first game yet. The other guys look like they're just going through the motions and they're hanging around 500 somewhere. And then boom, Phil Esposito to New York, Brad Park to Boston, John Vertel to Boston, etc. And now you've got a whole different, like, wow, what just happened to the Boston Bruins? I don't, we know they're not going to do the players, but if, 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 if things haven't updated while I wasn't looking and Mon, Jim Montgomery's still without a contract, this looks like a duck and walks like a duck. I've never yeah. seen it. I've never seen a situation like this go any other way. So if they're going to sit back here and say, okay, you've got two weeks or three weeks or you got till Thanksgiving, and I think Thanksgiving's a long time right now. Even though the Bruins have always used it as a as a marker, uh, I don't know that they're gonna. <laughs> I don't see. It looks like too long a marker right now. Um, they need signs. Well, if they're playing this way, it's definitely too long of a marker for sure. Right. So they're, they're right now. They're in. We got to stick together mode, and they think they're gonna find the solution. And I think they're probably using the logic that look, if we if we fire Monty and it's Jay Leach or Joe Sacco calling the shots here, then it's still you guys. It's still you. So I don't think they can be thinking this a lot the way McAvoy and Monty talked about it. it. It's happened that way, but it can never become strategy. It doesn't work as strategy. It just has happened. All right, let's take a break from the show to talk about our friends at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America and the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Instead of battling thousands of other players that could be pros or sharks, you simply pick more or less than on two to six player stat projections and you'll watch the winnings roll right in. It's fun and it's super simple. Prize picks is the best way to win real money this hockey season. Which players are going off? Which ones aren't? Which ones are lighting the lamp? Which ones are trying to do the Michigan? You can figure out all that stuff using prize picks. Make your picks in less than 60 seconds and turn your sports opinions into real money all season long on prize picks. And don't forget about the goalies being red hot and standing on their head either. Don't get dazzled by all the highlight reel goals. Think about your goalies, too. Let's see a little goalie love in this hockey world, especially at prize picks. All right, this week on prize picks, I'm looking at the hockey board and selecting Nathan McKinnon for more than 0.5 goals uh, and Evander Kane for more than 1.5 hits. Evander Kane running around, throwing the body at people. Also, David Pasternak for more than 2.5 shots on goal, not necessarily goals right now, though because the Bruins are struggling, and Sidney Crosby for more than 0.5 points. You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. Download the prize picks app today and use the code CLNS. 
and get $50 instantly when you play $5. That's code CLNS on prize picks to get $50 instantly when you play five bucks. What could be better than that? You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Prize picks, run your game. Well, it's, it's similar to what Monty was saying a couple days ago about uh, them being focused on the results instead of the work that's going to get the results and yeah. kind of being fixated on that and wanting to skip the steps we should of win. actually doing the work uh, to get those results. And yeah. I think that's what we're seeing. And, and that kind of mentality that they're just going to flip a, a switch and be able to turn it on after like dogging it for like a month uh, and, and, you know, conserving energy or you know, whatever the, the mentality they think they're doing by like having a different uh, approach here by not going for broke and not trying to be in first place by Thanksgiving. Steve, I, I just, this whole like attitude and that whole mindset seems problematic to me. Yeah. I think it's all about the narrative that they're, they're trying to create. They're trying to, to take the heat off themselves right now. And they said, don't worry about it. We're going to figure it out, but we all have eyes. <laughs> yep. It's not pretty. It's, uh, you know, there is, I, I would hope management at least gives the coach uh, uh, Tyler Johnson at least before yeah. uh, you know <laughs> yep. before they make a move. Yep. Um, but there are only so many line combinations you can try. Um, so yeah, the the, the October the, you know the, the whole narrative of, of don't worry, we've been great in October. So that means if we stink now, we're going to be great in, in the playoffs. It's just not. Right. It just doesn't work that way. No. Um, so they've got to figure figure out a way uh, and they've got good hardworking guys but as i said earlier they've got somehow ha they all have the yips right now they can't handle the puck um that's not a matter of you know not not working hard or whatever they just they cannot <laughs> make a simple pass right now and that's that's a problem and you know i don't know if that'll change when they if they change the coach but that's that, that's about the the only bullet that that uh that management has. Yeah, I agree that, like, look, the first shooter drop was Riley Tufty uh, being waived and sent down to Providence. They could do the same thing with Max Jones, potentially, because he was dreadful yeah. again last night. Minus three, no shots on net. Uh, like I said, was really late. I think on the, I think it was him with Brazo on the back check was really late getting there on the Orlov goal. Uh, so, like, maybe, you know, the waving of two of them, maybe assign Tyler Johnson. These are, like, rearranging some of the, the chairs on the Titanic um as the way they're playing right now but i like and, and you're right steve the yips and the passing and some of the stuff that's going on offensively and the way pasta looks consistently now with yeah. like what he's doing with the puck is really problematic and troubling when you see the way he's playing because it's he just looks like something's wrong with him he's looked like that all season like even though he's yeah. got six goals like some of the stuff he's doing with the puck it just doesn't compute and it doesn't yeah. look like normal pasta neck um, and maybe it's, it's, 50, do... it's I think it's 50 50 him and, and whoever he's playing with, because I don't know how many times have we seen, you know, him. He's set up and actually open for a one timer in the in the puck is in the skates. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it's not okay. a good pass to him. Yep. Yeah. That's true, too. Um, but like that part of it is definitely an issue. There's no question about it. But like I look at more from like making the coaching move of the coverage in the defensive zone, the taking of the penalties you know, a lot of the mental mistakes that they're making um, and the lack of like they did, they had to do last week during one of those practices. They did a high school back check drill during Bruins practice that I have not ever seen them do before. And usually that's something you do to teach young players how to back check in the level that they need to hustle in order to back check. And they were doing that at a Bruins practice, that drill where they have the two guys next. To, they have the four lines, the two guys on each side. They pass the puck down to the ICO the, uh, uh, together to, uh, towards each other. They shoot the puck, and then immediately they're on the back check chase and the next two going down the other way and shoot the puck, and they keep going back and forth. Like, that to me is a coach saying, you guys are not hustling. Like, we need to take it back to basics, and you need to actually, like, hustle as a five-man unit and play well together. Like, that kind of stuff to me is is indicative of a lack of effort and a lack of like uh rolling your sleeves up and doing the hard work and monty mentioned second and third effort last night as well which we have not seen from a no. lot of players morgan geeky was all second and third effort last year all the time we have not seen any of that from him in this first month of the season yeah 
So like, that's the stuff where I look at and I see what's going on right now. And I just don't think there's a lot of Bruins that are working hard enough right now under um, Jim Montgomery and are like disciplined enough and are like playing the right way where I see that as the reason the coaching move needs to be made. I just see so much evidence of a team that's not playing disciplined, good, well-coached hockey right now. And, and I think Montgomery's definitely feeling the heat, and rightfully so. They did not extend him. They did not do him any favors by no. putting him into this situation. I just don't see any way this, like, they, they get, get out of this without a coaching change. And, Mick, I was glad you mentioned the 2019 St. Louis Blues because, like, the big impetus there was Barubi coming in and taking over that team. And, you know, I, I, I do think the most impactful thing – that Bruins management can do to really snap this team out of it is to make a coaching change. And they have guys internally on that staff with Jim, with Jim Montgomery that I think they feel confident in potentially putting into that role. So I, I'll ask you, Steve, first, do you see any, any scenario where you think Montgomery gets out of this uh, and is the coach come playoff time? If they do actually make the playoffs Jim Moore style, like he's talking about, I, I just don't see that as there, there is any way that that happens. Uh, with the way things are going right now, I mean, I, I don't have any evidence. There's, there's nothing that you can you can grasp onto and say that okay, this might be working well right now. They can't even kill penalties, and they've always been able to kill penalties. Yep. And you know, same coach who's you know Joe Sacco's doing the, the penalty kill. He's been the the PK coach for a long time. You know, it, it's uh, yeah, I. I it's on the players. If the players are able to, 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 to pull the coach out of it this time, then, you know, that's how they do it. But, you know, there's nothing that I can say that, that that's a glimmer of hope. Mick? Yeah, from a, from a uh, possibility standpoint, I think they can find their way. I think the stick together is, is usually the beginning of that. And I think that as they rally around one another – that way, then they're going to play for one another. And I think that will be the germ that spreads into more trust on the ice. And we'll hear that cliche very soon. And, um, and then I think that they can find their way. I don't know from a prediction standpoint, if they'll be given that window of time, because I think it'll take them longer than I can imagine Cam, if not Donnie saying, "Uh, okay, that's it. You know, so um, I, I don't I don't like the timeline of what I think it would take for them to figure this out themselves without the coaching change versus the urgency that I think will come from above, especially because of the money they spent in the summer to say we're going to take a team that uh, that was better than we thought last year and put what they need on it this year and then they should win. And now and then obviously all the all the the season long referendum shifts over to to Donnie uh but the but a lot of fans are jumping way ahead of that right now in our social media conversations and wanting to blow everything up and making referendums about players completely di- irrespective of the last two seasons and just saying that this is this is it this is your test sample right here it's the only one that matters and i'm like yeah it's too it's way too early for me in that regard you know what team Boston sports fans are most excited about this time of year right now. It's not the Patriots, definitely not the Red Sox. I mean, I, there's plenty of Bruins fans that are very excited about the Boston Bruins, but I've got to tell you, I think the team that everybody's most excited about is the Boston Celtics. They're excited about NBA hoops coming back. They're excited to go to the Garden and watch the Celtics play defending that world championship and watching Jalen Brown, Jason Tatum, and all of those guys that they've loaded up on on their roster and you know where the best place to get Celtics tickets is to get tickets to the garden, to see basketball games. It's our friends at game time. Yes. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets by using the app, by getting your tickets through the app. Uh, It's the most exciting time of year for a basketball fan. Just look at all the features on the game time app. Uh, I love the all in pricing toggling. This feature shows you the total upfront with no surprise fees at checkout. Who hates, detests, I raise my hand, surprise fees at the checkout. Game time is not about that. They are about showing you up front what the cost of the tickets are. I am all about that. You can get seat views, get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy the tickets. 
Lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. If you're looking for Celtics tickets, game time is the place to go. You got to take the guesswork out of buying tickets for the Celtics. And oh, by the way, you can get Patriots tickets. You can get Bruins tickets. You can get concert tickets, comedy tickets, whatever you want. But we're talking the Celtics right now. You can use all of those things at game time. So create the game time app. Go to the game time app, create an account, and use the code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. But again, download the Game Time app. It's super easy to use. Create an account and use the code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Download Game Time today for all of your Celtics and NBA tickets, folks. What time is it? It's game time. No, there's definitely panic in the streets as far as the Bruins no fans go. It's you gone crazy. That they're playing right now. Yeah. And you do hear the blow it up thing, and, like, that's not happening. Like, that is not realistic. Yeah. There, there's no way that's happening. Nobody People does throwing that when they get the under the bus after, like, signing that huge contract and saying, oh, you know, where's where's your $8.25 million now? I've heard people saying that, too. And, like, this is not a Jeremy Swayman problem. Like, he has not been, like, great by any means, but, like, it is what's going on in front of him. Like, you cannot give guys clean – open looks from uh, the slot center cut ice uh, slot and expect that they're not going to score goals. This is the NHL. If you give them the middle of the slot, they're going to score. Um, but that said, it, that great- said, I'd like to take the opportunity to say that Cor- Corpus Allo has been every bit as good and yeah. deserves more playing time during this next path patch of hockey. Yeah, he's been fine. Like, he's been perfectly fine as a backup. I have no issues with Corpus Allo whatsoever. Um, it's a great point you make about Bruins management, and I do think that is a big factor here as well, that I don't think there's going to be a lot of patience because of what they invested over the summer, because of the expectations for this team, because of where, where Cam and Donnie uh, expect them to be and just where they've been. And I think the level that they – want this team expect this team to be at and it's like i'm sure highly unacceptable what they've seen on the ice uh to start this season and steve i think that's got to be a huge factor when you're thinking about the coach's fate and what's going to happen here too is just you know whatever uh, i'm sure there's going to be pressure from ownership like we shelled all all this money for these players and thought it was going to be a much better team and what's going on right now like i think that he becomes the fall guy for that kind of a situation with ownership and management as well jim montgomery yeah, and the, the the two big hires have really underperformed. Um, you yeah. know, last night, you know, they tie up the game on a, on a you know a lucky bounce uh, on the five on three, and yeah. then Marshawn makes a great feed down to Lindholm at the side of the net. You know, for I wouldn't say an easy tap in, but for you know a high skilled guy like Lindholm is, you know, you you redirect that into the net and he heals it wide. Um, and he hasn't – it's eight games now without a point, I think. I, I don't know if he picked up a point last night on one of those goals. Um, I yeah. don't think he did. Um, maybe, uh, maybe on the uh, – I, I don't know. But, uh, but Still not know, good enough. Ha- no, no, he hasn't been good. Uh, you know, you know, Zadorov started off the season, uh, what, seven, eight straight games taking a penalty. Uh, yep. and, and he had that, you know, he, he – on the on – the, the, I think the goal that kind of changed the whole – you know, complexion of the game, the third goal last night, he couldn't handle the puck at the blue line and then he falls down and then it's a, you know, it's a, it's a mishmash. Um, so those, they haven't gotten enough uh, out of those guys. I think Zadorov is really trying to, to make things happen. Last night he was trying to, you know, throw his weight around a little bit. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's just, just not working right now. And, you know, let's face it, some of the young guys, some of the promising guys, on the team, you know, uh, uh, are, you know, going through some growing pains right now. You know, Patra uh, in the Philly game, he, he did a, did a flyby on the goal. You know, that was the difference in the game. And last night, you know, you know, in throughout the season, Lorai has you know, had trouble with, with turnovers. Yeah, there was that so, one shift where Patra and Lowry last night just got completely manhandled yeah, by Jordan yeah. Stahl and all the Carolina <laughs> yeah. Hurricanes veteran guys yeah. behind the net, and it turns into a Carolina goal. That was just classic man against boys, like learning yeah. lesson in the NHL time for young players. And and you knew that was going to happen at some point yes. during the season, but you thought you had enough, you know, experienced veteran guys who could, you know, you know, that you could absorb those, you know, those bumps in the road, but it's not happening right now. Nobody's, nothing's working. And, uh, 
and yeah, I, I don't know how they get, get out of it without a major change. And like you said, you can't just, you know, pack up a, a, a Phil Esposito caliber player and ship them, ship them out of town anymore. Yeah. And they've already done the blockbuster with the two off season signings. Right. You know? Right. Or actually uh, three when you count the Elmark trade. So one, one thing I did like last night, Mick um, was low uh on the point for the top power play unit. And I know they didn't get a ton of results um, for yeah, it. That was kind of like, lost. They, what's that? that kind of, that was kind of lost and everything. All yeah, it was. Changes. Yeah. But but I liked that change, especially after the power play and their special teams in general let them down so much against the Flyers. I think they really had to make a move uh, to do something like that. And frankly, I think he should be there anyway. I just don't. Charlie McAvoy is a very good defenseman, not having a great year, but he is. I I just never have never felt like he's a a quarterback on a top power play unit. And I think low rise skill set more matches, um, you know, that kind of a role on a top power play unit more more than McAvoy's does. Um, that was something I an adjustment I did like to see last night from Montgomery and the coaching staff. Monty, I mean, I mean, McAvoy is such a dynamic, beautiful skater and powerful athlete that it's natural to think that you can develop that side of his game, but he wasn't, that wasn't his role at BU. And, yeah. and he didn't, you know, he, he never really developed that part of his game. He'd have to do it in the NHL and, and it's come very slowly and unevenly for him. And right now in middle of this, you know, <laughs> it'd be nice to see Kevin Shattenkirk back in this lineup right now, yeah. because right yeah. now they're desperate, but um one of the things, I know it's a little off topic here, but I don't want people to think I'm ignoring it or that we're ignoring it. But a lot of Marshian's captaincy is getting a lot of backlash right now on social, yeah. and I think he's been a better captain than a player this year. Uh, everything I, I hear agree. him say has been very on point and very insightful, and insightful the good way. Um, S i g h t. I just don't think his game has been good. His skating hasn't looked good for the most part. And, you know, so it just seems like every line except the Catholic line has had some sort of weak link or discombobulation point or somehow lack of chemistry. There's been like every line they throw out there has been fatally flawed in some regard in terms of performance. Uh, And, and now the Catholics line was broken up so that they could influence the other lines. I'm now more fearful that they're all going to catch the virus. And when they come back together, <laughs> they'll suck. <laughs> Catholic yeah. actually made a Hopefully nice play on the, uh, uh, on the Hampus Lindholm goal last night. What's that? Catholic actually made a nice play on the Hampus Lindholm goal last he night. So He did. That but, was a yeah, nice I, pass I, on the like, sidewalk. Yeah, I, I'd like to see that line back together, though. Yeah, Castle, I think, and Castle I think Beach. they will go back to that. Yeah, that felt like temporary. Like I'm gonna just try, like you know, whatever I can, uh, and hope it works, uh, kind of thing. Like Marshan last night, I actually thought his skating was better than it's been most of I agree. the season. I actually saw him moving last night and getting some separation from other players, and I thought he actually looked pretty good. Uh, maybe it was he was energized after getting that, like the mother of all good bounces on that <laughs> that goal that he scored yeah. on the uh, on the five on three. But, like, I agree with you. I, I think he said the right things. I think he's done the right things. I think the way he handled that issue with Montgomery on the bench um, was fantastic and a great show of leadership. Um, and I, I agree with you. I, I don't think from his perspective and from his standpoint, I don't think it's a leadership issue um, that's the problem with this team as far as the players go. I think he is the right leader for this team. Um, I just wonder, you know, if like a change in coach it changes the leadership a little bit too. Cause they, you know, as much as the captain is a leader, as much as all the guys that wear letters are leaders, the, a team also takes some of the way they play and some of their approach and some of their attitude from the head coach. I think it's true at, at every level of hockey that I think the head coach has a huge influence on the temperament of the team, on the way the team handles adversity, on the way the team plays. And I just don't look at Marshand, uh, Steve, as a guy that that should be shouldering a lot of the blame here for what's going on. No, no. Look, like Mick said, you know, he's he's not playing great right now. He was better last night. Um, but yep. as far as like the duties of the captain and, and how he's set the tone in his conversation with us, and you know, this 
I don't want to make us any more important, you know, mm-hmm. or make us sound so important that, but right. um, he sets the tone in those interviews, in those scrums. And I thought he's, I think he's done a very good job at that. Um, you know, we're not behind the scenes. You know, we don't know everything that goes on. But as far as we can tell, you know, he's been spot on in the things he said and, and how he's addressed where the team is. Bruins media came around in the third period of the Philadelphia game and what? and uh, took requests. I requested Charlie Coyle. We get down there. Who's talking? The C and the two A's. That had to be. Marsha and I told him, rip up the list. This is what we need to do. That's a leadership move. I loved it. I agree. Yeah. And like the thing about Marshan that I've noticed this year is it's been a tough year, but after every loss, he's there. Like he's going to answer the questions. He's going to be accountable. He is setting the tone as far as accountability goes and answering any of the questions that come along that way. And I think in that way, um, that's an important part of the captaincy. That's why some guys are cut out to be captain and some guys are not cut out to be captain is that willingness to be accountable, to answer questions, to do it in a clear eyed, uh, very uh, honest way, um, uh, accepting blame where it where it should be, you know, accepted and, you know, uh, setting the right mentality for everybody else. Like he does all of those things and um, he does it when they lose, when they win, no matter how things are going. Those are the best captains that are always there after the losses and are always accountable and are always going to be there to, to make sure the team message gets out. Um, and, and in that way, I think he's extremely important. I think he's done a good job this year. And I like, I I'm starting to see like the game come around too, which is important because they're going to need him. Uh, it, if there's one thing that's been clear to me, aside from the, like the roster issue or aside from the, the execution issues, aside from the Escher, uh, effort issues, uh, Steve, it's that this team roster composition wise, and maybe Ty- Tyler Johnson helps in this regard. But he's not a true top six forward in the NHL, I would say, though. It still feels like this team is one top six forward short of being a fully functional roster, too. Able to function offensively, able to be a danger to other teams, able to score a lot. It looks like they're going to have trouble offensively, even in the best of times, until they get that other top six forward. Yeah, we all knew that. We all knew they didn't replace Jake DeBrusque. Um, yep. And Jake hasn't, hasn't gotten off to a great start in Vancouver either, but you know, yep. they missed, you know, what he brought, the speed, especially. Uh, management knew that, you know, they, yep. you know, we saw him behind the B that, that Don Sweeney basically said, you know, we'll, we'll get somebody, you know, at some point during the season. Yes. Uh, yep. But you gotta, you gotta be in playoff position to, <laughs> to make that move. And, and Tyler Johnson, he's not a top nine guy, but he would help on the power play. And they need that help. Yep. You know, when they get those opportunities, they have to cash in on it better than what they are right now. Um, and that would go a long way. So they need to get him, you know, signed in playing, and then they go from there. Um, but, you know, if he's – I'm not sure he's the guy to, to change everything for them. No, but I do – they also could use another guy. A power play, absolutely. Like, I was actually shocked. I didn't realize how good a power play guy he was until I looked – at the numbers. Um, yeah. But also, all, I think all those numbers in Chicago were, were power play. <laughs> yes. And I, I think the other thing that he brings is kind of a veteran competitiveness, savvy experience. Yeah. Like I, I, there's only so long they can, they can uh, get by with the, the Max Jones, Riley Tufty kind of guys uh, putting them in forward spots where they're just doing nothing, you know, and, and Jones is obviously still here. Tufty's not, but like, I, there's only so long they can put one of those guys in one of the 12 spots nightly where they're playing games. And, and I like Max Jones personally, he seems like a good guy. And like he was a former yeah. first round pick, he's clearly got talent, but he has shown very, very little here in the start of the season. And Tyler jo- Johnson showed much more in the preseason and in training camp of ways Mick, he would be able to help this team, um, you know, before and after they potentially go out and get a top six forward that they know they're missing. Yeah, and I think that that's what I meant by the Shattenkirk thing is is not yeah is really Tyler Johnson. It's a different widget, but it's a similar influence. You're yeah. talking about a guy who's better years way behind him, but he's still a crafty individual who, when put in those positions, you know where you're outnumbered, you have to play with your sticks. You can't go hitting people. So Tyler Johnson can be a very good player there in that kind of game, and that's the power play. So. You know, and, and the fact that 
the season's been disastrous so far for for Geeky, for Frederick. Uh, and and Plotra looks like he's really struggling to fight through all of the, the, the abuse right now that people are really trying to rough him up and he's trying to hang in there. But it's not a productive situation right now. And and it's it's coming back around to say, okay, what do you got in Providence? What do you got? What are we doing with Tyler Johnson? And as Steve noted on on uh, X, you know the Tufty uh, uh, waiver clearance and assignment to Providence opens up enough cap space to sign Johnson. So I don't know what they're waiting for right now. I this would not have been on my radar to go grab him, but at this moment, the way this team is right now. It seems like a no-brainer. Yeah, and and we're now past um, where they signed Denton Heinen last year. That was October 30th. I, that was like eight or nine games into the season, so we're past that point uh, with Tyler Johnson now. I still expect they're going to sign him because I don't think he would be here if they weren't sure they were going to do it and it wasn't going to happen at some point. Um, but I would expect that to happen soon. Maybe that is like the next domino and that's the last thing they do before they end up making potentially a coaching change. We'll see how uh, it shakes out, but it's going to be an interesting week regardless, Steve and Mick, I'm sure. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, us today. Uh, let's also thank our sponsors, Prize Picks. Download the Prize Picks app today and use the code CLNS and get $50 instantly when you play five bucks. That's code CLNS on Prize Picks to get $50 instantly when you play five dollars. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. How good is that? It's guaranteed. Prize Picks run your game. Uh, let's also thank the folks at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code CLNS for twenty dollars off your first purchase of any kind of tickets, sports tickets, comedy tickets, uh, concert tickets, all that stuff. Terms do apply, of course, but download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code CLNS for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. What time is it, Mick? Game time. Game time. Steve, Mick, thank you very much for joining us. Alrighty, thank you. <laughs> Everybody else out there, thanks for listening. We'll see you at the room.